The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. What we're actually seeing is really a long time normalization of Turkish politics, where basically religious expression has been allowed to come through, take its rightful place, if you like, in the political landscape. And so, what we've seen over the journey with Erdogan is that people actually have a party which relates to their values. And that's why I think he does consistently well, is because actually the majority of the country is religious. And I think this is a view that we in the West forget, this relationship between the state and citizens in Turkey. It's not a, a dialogue, it's a monologue where the state is seen as a protector, it's a father basically, and the citizens adhere to everything the state does. And in return, the state protects and provides for them. Whereas in Western democracies, citizens don't have that psychology. It's a much more of a two-way street. In this episode, Turkey's Teflon president. What does another five years under Erdogan mean for the country? Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia research specialist at the University of Melbourne. With Recep Tayyip Erdogan winning the right to lead Turkey for another five years, adding to his already two decades in power as prime minister come president, what lessons can be drawn from the election, and what does it mean for the country's domestic politics? A cobbled together opposition appeared for a time to threaten the beleaguered Erdogan, with an economy in genuine crisis. Big questions over his government's handling of the aftermath of the devastating earthquake in February of this year, and growing sentiments against an influx of millions of refugees from across the country's southern border with Syria. But after being forced to a deciding runoff election, Erdogan was successful, albeit with a near 50 50 split in votes, a reflection perhaps of Turkey's highly polarised political landscape. So, what does the election result say about the state of democracy in Turkey, where an entire generation has never known another national leader? And should we expect Erdogan to continue with his populist authoritarian style and policies and practices that, as critics maintain, have led to a deliberate hollowing out of state institutions and entrenched illiberalism? Joining me to look at what's in store for Turkey and its 85 million people as Erdogan begins his third decade in power are Dr David Tittensor, Senior Lecturer in Islamic Studies at Asia Institute, and Turkish politics and policy researcher Dr Tezcan Gumush, who has a new book out, Turkey's Political Leaders, Authoritarian Tendencies in a Democratic State. It's from Edinburgh University Press. Welcome back to Ear to Asia, David and Tez. Thanks so much, Ali. Great to be here. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you very much, Ali. Well, it was a, in the end, 52 to 48 percent final vote for president. Given the challenges facing Turkey after 20 years of Erdogan's rule, especially economic, Tez, why are the Turkish people so apparently divided virtually, if you take the vote, virtually down the middle? But this is not a trend that's come about this election. And when we look at elections for the last 10 years, and we can see that the votes for Erdogan and the AKP, so his party, well, his party's had about 35% to 40% vote, and him as the leader has um, hovered around 50%. And the non Erdogan vote has been, you know, the other sort of 50%. So Turkey has been on this polarized projection for a while now. And this election pretty much really exemplified that. Turkey is now has transitioned into some subtype of authoritarian system. So in particular, after the change into a presidential system in the constitutional referendum a few years ago. And what that does is it gives extraordinary amount of unchecked powers in the hand of the president, which is Erdogan. And so what that means is that he controls single-handedly all the key democratic and state institutions. So the bureaucracy, the judiciary is stacked and now with partisan appointments. You also have the 90% of the media landscape, which is 
dominated by Erdogan or pro Erdogan media. So, which means that it's a massive megaphone for Erdogan, and that allows him to dominate the political narrative and shape it that is very favorable to himself and deny the opposition from basically getting their key messages out and changing or challenging that pro Erdogan narrative. David, can I bring you in here? Because he does have all the tools at his disposal, as Tez just said. But Erdogan is also a master campaigner, isn't he? Look, he's definitely a very uh, canny politician. And I think something that Tez alluded to there, this is not something which is new. It's developed over time. And I perhaps take a slightly longer view than what Tez is alluding to in terms of just a few elections back. I think for me, and what I've argued in my own work, is what we're actually seeing is really a long time normalization of Turkish politics, where basically religious expression has been allowed to come through, takes its rightful place, if you like, in the political landscape. For a long time, religious parties were shut down. The guardian of the secular state was the military, and they would shut down religious parties. So Erbakan's parties, you know, back in the day in the 70s, also the 90s and so forth, and early 2000s. And of course, so what's happened is that religion's always been bubbling under the surface. And I think there's a misconception in terms of when you talk about that polarization, where is it coming from? It's actually that religion has been suppressed for a long time. It hasn't been allowed to express itself continually and properly in the political process. And so What we've seen over the journey with Erdogan is that people actually have a party which relates to their values. And that's why I think he does consistently well, is because actually the majority of the country is religious. And so probably I would say, for me, I'm thinking that the secular group is actually in the minority. So they have a challenge to actually sort of erode part of his base. And particularly over the years with rural to urban migration, the landscape has changed completely. So you've actually got religious people living in those urban centres now as well, particularly from the 1950s onwards. He's actually got a very strong base that he's working off. And so the challenge for the secular party, which had a monopoly in the early days, is now to try and claw that back. So he's actually working from a fairly strong position to begin with. Tess, do you agree with that, that it's the uh, the approach, the treatment of religious Turks that is so key? Yeah, I mean, Erdogan, he is a master of identity politics and religion is key factor to that. So he really has no issue about using religious and and conservative values to polarise society and basically demonise the opposition as being atheist or godless. And this election in particular, the LGBTQ rights, was really used as a threat as well. Um, Basically termed it as, well, if the opposition coming to um, power then there's going to be LGBT rights, men are going to be marrying men and women are going to be marrying women. And, you know, this is basically completely against our cultural values. So he really used this identity politics to uh, basically consolidate his base, which being the conservative person in Turkey has always outnumbered the strictly secular person in Turkey. So he knows that this always is going to get him the majority of votes because he knows that the strictly secular is not going to vote for him, but he doesn't care. He doesn't really want to bridge those gaps. He knows that his numbers, his voter base is always going to be a slight majority. That's always going to give him that victory. And David, that appeal to the religious conservatism is all tied in with the nationalist message, isn't it? The the, uh, the call to Turkish greatness. Yeah, he's sort of got a, a neo-Ottoman narrative that he's been cultivating over an extended period of time. where He sort of wants to return to the grandeur, if you like, to a sense of that Turkey was a major player in the world. And so he often refers back to the, the Halcyon days of the Ottomans. I mean, there have been some wonderful set pieces, and Tez will probably remember, when he, uh, with his huge palatial palace, had all of these soldiers in cosplay from the Ottoman periods. So he sort of references that and talks about, you know, the greatness of it and how in a way, as I said before, that the religion was kind of suppressed. And so the natural, I guess, milieu of Turkey was suppressed to some extent. And so he's bringing that back and championing that. And it also plays out, I guess, to some extent, in the foreign policy that they've pursued with their zero problems with the neighbours, where they reached out initially to Assad, to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, to Anada in Tunisia, and so forth, is that they wanted to be a play in the Muslim world. And that sort of builds on that idea that they want to reclaim that position. So if we turn to the opposition, and and Tez, you alluded to this in your first answer, before we get to perhaps what they did wrong, they were always facing an uphill battle, weren't they? Yeah, that's correct. In particular, when you are campaigning in the electoral period, you need to reach your message to a variety of the electorate. Now, if you don't control any of the media, and if 90% of the media is anti-opposition, not just pro Erdogan, anti-opposition, then you're going to have a really, really tough time or virtually really nil chance of 
getting a message out to the Erdogan voter base. Because as David alluded to previously, the secular establishment, which is the main opposition party, the Republican People's Party, or the Turkish acronym of the CHP, has to eat into Erdogan's voter base to actually increase its votes or to get into power. Now, if you don't have the media in your control or favorable to you or objective media, then you're not going to really get very far in terms of setting the narrative. And what Erdogan was able to do was, you know, as he's always done, is very much create this fear and threat around the opposition if they get into power, connecting with them with the, the PKK terrorist group, uh, so the Kurdish Workers' Party that Turkey has been um, having ongoing conflict with since the 1980s. And so it makes basically really tying the opposition to them and all, again, you know, the LGBTQ rights as well. He did a very good job in demonizing the opposition, using the media to amplify that message continuously for people. So even though these were blatant lies, you know, the opposition couldn't um, get their message across and counter that. There's interviews with people and the, just the everyday person on the street will say, yeah, you know, well, the opposition was basically in cahoots with terrorists. Why am I going to vote for the terrorist party and so forth? Even though this was not the case, but it just shows shows you how much power Erdogan has through his control of the media. David, tell us about the opposition leader, Kalic Ulu. How effective was he? Well, Kilic Toroglu was perhaps not super effective as a leader. He wasn't actually the preferred candidate for the opposition. He actually kind of foisted himself on the coalition. He was the largest component of that opposition alliance. And so he sort of pushed for his position. And so to give an indication of how perhaps he wasn't really the best candidate to run was the fact that shortly before the election, uh, Meryl Akshener, uh, one of the alliance members uh, threatened to pull out of the uh, election because there were other candidates that they saw as being more effective, more popular than Kilic Toroglu. So you had Ekrem Imamoglu, who's the mayor of Istanbul, who had actually won the mayoral election and twice after it was reset, and Amansu Yavash, who is the mayor of Ankara. And both of them were much more popular than Kilic Toroglu. Now, the issue with Imamoglu was that there was a spurious court case that was brought against him for insulting the high election board. And so he was had a, a two and a half plus year the jail sentence put on, which was on appeal. So he had a sort of a sword of Damocles hanging over his head so he couldn't run. So actually Erdogan had actually effectively eliminated Imam Oldu, who was the most popular candidate, who had actually won elections against the leading party or leading alliance uh, at the municipal level. And then you had Yavash. And so what Akshana was arguing was, we really want to go with someone who we feel has had success, who can actually challenge. And so the compromise situation was that they would be deputies under Kilatrola if he was successful. So really, uh, and I think Tez alluded to this already, that there were certain mistakes or missteps that were made. And this is certainly one of those in terms of the campaign was they didn't put their best candidate forward. Now, with Imam Olu, you can kind of understand because of those court proceedings. But then you had Yavash, who would have, again, been, I think, a more popular candidate than Kilich Rolo. So there's this tendency to not want to give up one's pride or position within the party. And so this was a major handicap for the campaign. And Tess, do you think that even with all the structural impediments that you've referred to, if there was another candidate, if Imam Olu had been able to stand, it would have been a different outcome? I guess that's a hypothetical, but given, as David mentioned, the polls even a, a year prior to the elections were showing that Imamul and Yawash were clear front runners against Erdogan in the surveys. The other thing is that the six party alliance block, four of these were electorally in, inconsequential parties running at like 0.5% of vote or at the most 1% of voter or electoral support. So these parties, although it was, a, I guess we could say it's a broad alliance, four parties pretty much brought nothing to the table, brought nothing to the campaign. They don't have the resources. They're extremely minor parties. And they're also very conservative and religious leading one or two of them as well. So you're pandering to their base, but yet they're actually not bringing anything to the opposition voting bloc, really. So you've got those type of strategic mistakes. But I definitely think that if you were to have a much more charismatic leader in Imamolo, then, yeah, that would have seen a, a higher vote count compared to what Kalishtarolu brought with his candidacy because Kalishtarolu is has been in, the head of the main opposition party, the CHP, since 2010, and is a very uncharismatic person. Under his leadership, the CHP has not passed the 25% mark. So he's reached his ceiling in terms of trying to gather electoral support for his party. So it was definitely up to someone fresh, someone's much more inspiring that could get to the grassroots and rally more support and build 
breaches with certain segments of the AKB voter. So yes, there's a core group that you'll never get to in the AKP voter base, but there's also others that would have been willing to, to switch based on the charisma and the personality of the opposition presidential candidate, which I think would have been Ima Mola rather than Klitsch at all. And Tess, how much do you read into the impact of the opposition shift in strategy between that first round of the presidential election and the second? Because it was quite marked, wasn't it? The first round was all about inclusivity. The second round, there was a far more strident approach taken, especially towards refugees. Yeah, I mean, it was a complete change. So you had the first campaign leading up to the first electoral vote. You had a very inclusive, the love symbol that you make with the hands became uh, the symbol of the opposition. It was very pro-rights, pro-democratic. We're going to welcome everyone into our bosom. We don't care who you are. We're for the religious vote. We're for the secular vote. We're for everyone. And then when the opposition did not get up, with the first vote. And I think there was a lot of hubris and naivety because they thought that they would win in the first vote given everything was so bad in the country and they believed their own polling, and which obviously was incorrect. I don't think they actually had a plan B for the second vote. So what happened was this complete change to a very nationalistic, pro-nationalist, anti-immigrant narrative and where the presidential candidate clinched it all in the runoff, allied himself with an extremely right wing or hard right, even fascist. Um, he has very fascistic type of policies to win the nationalist vote in the runoff election, which ended up turning away the Kurdish vote in the east and southeast of the country, where there was a slight drop off in the runoff vote. And that's pretty much blamed on Klitsch Dural taking this very hard right turn to appeal to the nationalist or nationalist populist vote. So it definitely um, did not really benefit him in the long run. What it actually showed opposition voter was, hang on a sec, this guy was not authentic from the beginning. Look how quickly he chops and changes just so he can win a few votes here and there. And that really cemented the negative view towards him, which, you know, by him changing so quickly just to be able to win an election. Absolutely. It was a very, very hard turn. Uh, and I think that the hard turn was precipitated by a surprise polling by a candidate, Sinan Owan, who is sort of a former member of the Nationalist Action Party. And as Tez was saying, was quite right wing and had anti-immigrant views. And so there was a, a campaign from both sides to try and capture that 5% block, which sort of outstripped, I think, polling expectations in the lead up to the election for the presidential candidates. So, yeah, I think one is probably right in being a little bit cynical that going from, you know, a message of love and inclusivity to all of a sudden we're going to expel all of these uh, immigrants, to be fair, which has also been taken in on part where Turkey's had a hand in creating destabilisation in Syria as well. So, yes, I think that was a bit of a sharp turn and we would have lost face as a result of that. And David, what role do refugees and immigrants play in, in the political landscape? Are they a point of division between the opposition and Erdogan? Uh, certainly from what I've seen is that Erdogan has certainly taken a softer line. I think there's still an underlying degree of xenophobia in Turkey, particularly reports of too much Arabization taking place and so forth. And I think uh, the point of difference that Erdogan has made is saying that there's going to be maybe a phased approach of assisting people to return rather than rhetoric of saying we're just going to expel. So certainly he's taken a softer line uh, as a point of differentiation from the hard line that Kilic took. So for a long time, polling has shown that 70 to 80 percent of Turks have anti-immigrant views. And I think this is really after 10, 11 years, it's really reached a heightened level, given that Turks pretty much see that they've done their hospitality duties and it's time for, you know, especially Syrians and other irregular migrants or asylum seekers to be sent back home. So the opposition really picked up on this sentiment in public, whereas Erdogan definitely, as David has said, has taken a much more softer line. Now, companies aligned with Erdogan or the AKP have basically come out and said a lot of times that a lot of these uh, refugees shouldn't go home because they're a source of cheap labor for them. So it's not because of altruistic or very inclusivity or pro-refugee views that the government has. It's because it meets their economic needs to have this cheap unregulated labor. But the other thing is the National Security Council in Turkey, which looks after all the main key policy issues of the country, so in particular security, it's the first time that they came out and acknowledged that the refugee issue needs to be solved. 
and they will look at steps working with Europe and their neighbouring partners to resolve this issue and maybe resettle refugees in other countries. So now it actually has become a key point that the government has acknowledged. So yes, they have never had this very extremely anti-immigrant rhetoric, but there is this underlying understanding that this issue, this anti-immigrant sentiment within the electorate needs to be resolved somehow to appease Turkish citizens. David, do you share Tez's uh, cynicism about motivations, uh, commercial motivations for support of immigrants? Oh, look, I think there probably is a view that there's a benefit to having cheap labour, unregulated labour. But I would think that, as Tez pointed out, it's been quite a considerable amount of time that you've had three million plus refugees Uh, There is, as I said, underlying xenophobia, and there's a strong desire, I think, from many citizens of Turkey for these refugees to go home. So certainly, I think both Erdogan and the opposition are alive to this. I just think that possibly that Erdogan, obviously, with the position of incumbency, has played it softer. And as I said, it's talking more of a phased approach rather than this sort of fiery rhetoric that Kilic Trollo has gone with, which, again, would have turned off particularly some more of his uh, uh, liberal-aligned voters from his particular bloc. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at Melbourne asiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by Turkey Watchers, Dr. Tezjan Gumush and Dr. David Tittensor. We're talking about the aspirations and realities of Turkish politics as Recep Tayyip Erdogan begins his third decade in power. Let's look more closely at some of the key issues. And we began this podcast talking about the economy. Inflation actually hit 85% last October. It's come down a fair way since then, but it's still extraordinarily high. On the face of it, uh, Tez, wouldn't you think that a ruling government would be punished for that sort of cost of living pain? Yes, definitely. In most democratic countries, it'd be more than enough to bring down a government. But in Turkey, this has not transpired to be so. And I think which has left many of us scratching our heads. Now, there are some reasons given for this. Again, that Erdogan's control of the media, basically this demonization of the opposition and bringing the threat the PKK, the LGBTQ issue as being this threat to cultural values, was able to hijack the political narrative and really deny the opposition any oxygen from constantly highlighting how bad the economy was going. So you've got the media helping Erdogan out to really deny space or oxygen for for this criticism of the economy. But at the same time, Tez, every time you went to a shop, every time you looked at your pay packet, every time you filled your car up, you would be aware of just how hard things were. Yeah, this is very true. So when we see in the cities around the coastline, which are the major economic hubs of Turkey, Klitsch that all actually came out first in the votes. The theory that's given for this in terms of inner Anatolia, which was very pro Erdogan, was the people that have suffered the major brunt of this economic crisis is those living in these major urban cities. Hence why the opposition was able to win. And again, we will look a few years back, uh, the councils are in the opposition hands. In Anatolia, given the clientelism that is pervasive in Turkey, the government was able to provide a level of resources and kickbacks to be able to soften the blow to people that live in these regions because their cost of living and the standard of living is definitely not as high as what it is in these major urban cities and around the coastlines. So we saw that Erdogan came out and said, you know, if I'm re-elected, then I'm going to give X amount of raise to public servants and pensions are going to get X amount of raise. So a lot of people were, you know, happy to get this. But the other point is that if you're voting for the opposition, you don't know what you're going to get in terms of economic benefits. So even though your life might be getting harder, at least you know that somewhere along the line, the government is actually going to increase your wages, whereas with the opposition, you don't know what you're going to get if they come into power. David, how do you read the apparent Teflon nature, I guess, of the Turkish president? Well, I think there are two things, and Tess has picked up on both of those. I think that definitely the cut through, the capacity or the lack of oxygen for the opposition to actually get their message across. And a really good example of this was, uh, I think it was in, before the second round, 
electoral or the opposition put out text messages and the text messages were about credit and debt. And the very next day, Erdogan banned the use of text messages for propagandistic issues. So that just highlights how stifling the situation is with the incumbent government using the levers of the state to actually prevent the opposition from getting their message through. So they're trying to talk about the cost of living crisis, the high inflation, and so on. But as soon as they do, the levers of the state are used against them to prevent from getting that message out. Uh, We've mentioned the media before. Uh, I think it was somewhere in the vicinity of 32 hours of airtime for Erdogan to 32 minutes for Kilic Torolu. So it's really difficult to get the cut through for that message. And I think really one of the funnier moments I saw as I was watching the election unfold was Imam Oldu, who was chatting with a woman in the bazaar in Istanbul. And she was complaining to him saying, "Uh, look how you're running the economy. And he retorted saying, oh, actually, no, 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 I I don't run the economy. The government runs the economy. You know, I'm just the mayor. And she's like, no, 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 we're very happy with the government. Thank you very much. And that was pretty much the nature of the exchange. There was also a disconnect to some extent for some people, even as associating the economic problems with, you know, the the incumbent government. So again, there's just a complete almost shutout of the opposition of trying to prosecute their message against the woes of his, you know, war against interest and so forth. So that's one element. As Tez also pointed out, something that the ruling, I guess, Justice and Development Party and now in the Alliance have done is what we call vote touting. So often, and this has been well documented, they go out, they're giving out bags of coal, firewood, various other things to people in those rural regional areas, which is their stronghold. I mean, even just in the last election round, Erdogan was giving out 200 lira notes to children, which I think was in contravention of electoral rules. That is appeasement. Tez? With a lot of these in Anatolia voters, it's like, well, we might as well just vote for the person that we know that has always come through to us. Yes, the economy is bad, but at least they've tried their best to soften that blow for us citizens. So they actually see them as saviors. And there's this whole thinking of, yes, maybe Erdogan got us into this mess, but it's only Erdogan that can save us from this mess as well. And Tez, is there something in that too when it comes to the, again, what many outsiders would consider extraordinary, the fact that in the areas of that devastating earthquake where more than 50,000 people were killed, lots of revelations around lax enforcement of building codes, lots of people unhappy with the speed of the response, and yet Erdogan's party did well in those major earthquake zones. So when the earthquake happened, Hundreds of thousands of people were forced to leave those regions and move to other cities. So you had a lot of outflux of people. Now in Turkey to vote, you have to vote where your address is registered. So a lot of these people had to return back to these devastated regions to undertake a vote. Now, the opposition did try to help them by hiring buses and so forth to be able to take these people back during the voting days to these uh, regions to vote. But there's many, many thousands that wouldn't have been able to return. So you've got that. The other thing is, again, goes back to this thing of the government promised to rebuild those cities within two years' time. And so people are like, well, you know, they promised to rebuild these cities. Yes, there's, you know, a lot of people have died. It's lax enforcement of laws. There's corruption. But at the end of the day, in two years, we're going to get our homes back because Erdogan, again, it's the personalization of the state or the government. Erdogan is going to rebuild our homes for us again. So there is this thing of, well, if I don't vote for him, maybe we won't get those homes in two years' time. Is the opposition going to rebuild those homes for us Tez, you just talked about the personalisation of the state, and I guess this is a really important point. You argue that Turkey has a, a history of leader domination. Indeed, that's your new book. Is it about the party or the man, or is it always about the man or maybe one day the woman in Turkey? It's definitely the personalisation of politics. You know, as I argue in my book, throughout multi-party history, parties have always been personalised under their leaders. So it's been very leader-centric parties. Outside the Republican People's Party, so the, the original founding and party of the state, the CHP, every other party pretty much come and gone with the fortunes of their leader. So once a leader passes away or once a leader is forced into retirement, because as I argue in my book, <laughs> most of the leaders do not leave leave their parties. They either die or they're forced. And so their party's fortunes go with them. And Erdogan has been able to, given 20 years in power and having such a massive majority throughout that 20 years, he's been able to really dominate 
and entrench himself as the head of the state. So, you know, in 20 years, he's been able to personalize the entire state, not just his party. And now when we look at the difference between the parliamentary election results and the presidential, we've seen the parliamentary election results. His party, the AKP, actually lost votes from the previous election. So they dropped down to about 35% of the vote. Maybe uh, David would be able to correct me there. Whereas Erdogan's able to get 52% of the vote. So you can see just the end of the day, how popular Erdogan is. And if there is a day when in a post-Erdogan world, the AKP, I do not think, will be able to survive electorally without him because Erdogan is the AKP and people vote for the AKP because of Erdogan. David, do you agree with that? And I'll come back to what a post-Erdogan world might look like in a minute, but do you agree that Erdogan is the AKP and vice versa? Oh, very much so. And I want to pick up on something that, that Tess said before in relation to earthquake, which I think really important because he pointed out the fact that that Erdogan is seen as the, the sort of the individual that can fix it, that there's the unknown quantity of the opposition and that we know that we're going to get the houses built in um, two years' time with Erdogan. But I think also just speaking on this side of this almost Teflon quality of Erdogan, in spite of the fact that we've had this terrible disaster, I think that there's some important things to just note in relation to that terrible disaster, but it's not the first time this has happened. So there was a previous earthquake in 1999 in Izmit where you saw similar levels of devastation. Uh, and there were similar accusations against the government at that time about laxity around construction and the poor you know, checking of regulations and so forth. And so what we can see is this narrative around dodging the rules and doing things in the improper way is not confined to him. So it's not something which is just on Erdogan. But on top of that, research shows that in times of crisis, particularly natural disasters, people actually turn more to religion than not. And so, again, Erdogan is, again, that representation of their values, what they want to see in the party and the state and so forth. So in a way, I think that speaks to why we're all scratching our head going, you know, with the high interest rates and with the devastation of the earthquake, how is this possible? But these are some of the factors that sort of allow him a bit of wriggle room, if you like, in terms of dealing with these crises, because he is the party and they do see him as the one that can fix it because again he's the strong man he's the person that embodies their values versus the unknown opposition i'll just give you an example of something that i guess myself and david is saying so there was an article that just came out it's a turkish article and a journalist goes to izmir izmir is the heartland of the opposition always has been it's on the western coast just facing the greek islands a very secular has always been very progressive as well in the city of Izmir, there's a town, a neighborhood, which is populated by Roma people. And from there, the results came as a massive victory to Erdogan. So the journalist goes there to talk to these people. Why? In Izmir, you know, in this heartland of CHP, that there's this little neighborhood that has overwhelmingly voted for Erdogan. And the person's interviewing people and they're like, yeah, no, our lives are suffering. And this is a really poor neighborhood too, extremely poor neighborhood, which suffers probably more so than anybody else, the brunt of this economic crisis. And they're like, why, why are you even worse off than what you were? And like, yeah, but that's our man. He's a strong man. He will get us out of this. He's the one that talks big. He talks tough. And that's what we want in our politicians. And so this really goes down to psychology of why when we say, oh, you know, everything's going so bad, it's crisis ridden, but people still vote for him. It's because there's this psychology of like, whoever's going to do it, it's going to be our man, Erdogan, because he's a strong leader. He'll provide for us. He's the father, basically. And I think this is a view that we in the West forget. This relationship between the state and citizen is Turkey is not a, a dialogue. It's a monologue where the state is the protector, is seen as the protector, and the citizens adhere to everything the state does. And in return, the state protects and provides for them. Whereas in Western democracies, citizens don't have that psychology. It's a much more of a two-way street, give and take relationship. Whereas in Turkey, the state or the leader of the state is seen as a provider and the father. It's fascinating. And David, I mean, especially against that backdrop and the sort of conversation we've been having, how much change do you think we'll see? over the next five years under Erdogan? I mean, he's promised a new Turkish century. If he's if he was re-elected, that was the promise before he was successful. Do you think we'll see much change? Uh, with his new cabinet, Shimshek coming back, who was previously finance minister and who was actually opposed to his approach to interest rates and keeping them low, the suggestion there is that there's going to be a move towards economic orthodoxy in terms of managing inflation. This is also reflected in a recent appointment to the central bank with Hafiza Erkan, 
who's been appointed, who's a former banker and worked at Goldman Sachs in, in the US, who also is seen as being a proponent of that orthodoxy. So I think there is a suggestion that in the short term, at least, he's recognized that he has to deal with high inflation and the cost of living pressures. But beyond that, I don't really see Erdogan shifting too much in terms of outlook, you know, either domestically or uh, internationally. Uh, I think Erdogan takes very much a mandate view from winning the election. So even though it's close, so as it was 52 to say 48, that's enough. Having won that, this is the view of the people. And that was, I also think when he was talking about now is a time for unity, not a time for anger, not a time for any sort of pushback or anything like that. It's basically him saying, I've won. Now I get to prosecute my vision. And, and I think that given that he's been in power now, he's entering into his possibly his third decade of power, he's going to be emboldened to keep doing what he's doing. And I think that's also reflected in the fact that Hakan Fidan has now become his foreign minister, who's moved from the being the chief spy, uh, and that his spokesperson, Ibrahim Cullen, has moved into being the chief spy master now with the National Intelligence Agency. He's pretty much changed his entire cabinet. It is a bunch of technocrats, which does all go well, but I think he's got his very much his inner circle in and around him. He's going to, I think, feel emboldened and continue on the path that he sets. Tez, do you agree? I definitely agree. One thing we shouldn't forget is Erdogan controls everything. He either green lights or red lights decisions. So yes, he's got this new cabinet. He always goes through cabinets consistently. So it's another strategy. Of, well, you know, I am the leader, but you know, if things are going wrong, then the certain minister was incompetent. It's not my fault. But in reality, we know Erdogan is the one in complete control. We shouldn't read too much into the new cabinet. We've got to give it some time. But definitely, it looks like with Shimshek as the Minister of Finance and also New Central Bank, he is trying to signal to international markets that they will take a much more orthodox economic policy to stabilize the situation, to invite foreign investment into the country and try improving the economy slowly. So how autonomous these new ministers are going to be, I'm cynical in that sense because there's a lot of structural issues that need to be overcome if we're going to improve the economy in Turkey. So the entrenched corruption, the clientelism that is, you know, is connected to that and so forth. And I don't see the, you know, head of central bank and a new minister of the economy to be able to do that themselves without Erdogan's support. There is, of course, a- another question, and I know it's purely in the realms of speculation, but I think it's important that we raise it, and that is the apparent frailty of Erdogan at times, and there is speculation around his health. Tez, is there a succession plan, an heir apparent, on, on what you were saying before, uh, if Erdogan is not there, perhaps neither is the AKP? Yeah, There's been murmurs that his youngest son-in-law, Bayraktar, he is seen as maybe the successor to Erdogan. Now, at the end of the day, as unfair and unfair Turkish elections are, you still need to be able to win enough to vote to maintain the presidency or to become the president. Erdogan is a completely different political animal that since Atatürk, Turkey has not seen. He is very charismatic. He speaks the language of the common person, the common conservative person, religious, conservative values. He appeals to, as we can see, 52% of the segment regularly. I don't know who can come and replace him and have that much electoral support and maintain um, the position of the AKP in governing the state. So I'm really sceptical in that because like we alluded to before, Erdogan is the AKP and people vote for the AKP because of Erdogan. And even if there was a competent successor in Bayraktar, I still don't think he'll be able to maintain that level of support in the medium to long term. Maybe in the short term, definitely like riding out that wave. But in the longer term, I don't see anybody else to be able to maintain a 52% electoral support base going forward. David, do you think there's any question over Erdogan's ability to fulfil five years? Uh, of course, I'm asking you to look into a, a big crystal ball there. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, he certainly has been looking more frail, uh, as I saw one report saying the rapidly ageing Erdogan. So certainly uh, there's a question mark of will he ride out the whole five-year term? I share Tess's cynicism about whether or not some sort of succession plan can be put in place. These things often don't pan out very well. You know, we've seen that in other countries. Hosni Barak tried it. It didn't go very well. Same with Gaddafi in Libya and so forth. 
And so there is murmurs of this other son-in-law coming through. One view is that possibly, and this speaks to what Tess was saying, maybe in the short term, given the control that Erdogan has shaped through his reforms in terms of having uh, almost blanket control of the media, the control of the judiciary, and most other apparatuses of the state, that would possibly take even a mediocre replacement and help them stay for a while, but it may not be enough to keep them in the long term. So yeah, as far as that, the crystal ball goes, I'm only prepared to say it might work in the short term, uh, but maybe not over the long haul. So what about the future of the opposition? I mean, there's been pressure on Kalitaolu to resign. David, do you think he will go? What will happen to Imamulu? Uh, he, as you said, has that two and a half year jail sentence hanging over his head. Will he go to jail? Will that mark the end of his political career? There's, there's precedent for jail not marking the end of political careers. I mean, Erdogan was jailed very early on for reciting a poem. Uh, early on in his political career, and he came back. And I think the rules were changed to allow for people to come back from that. So in terms of the opposition, I think absolutely not in terms of Kilich will not resign. Uh, and, and Tez knows this better than anybody, that there is a history of leaders in every political party just sort of holding onto the reins very, very firmly uh, and not letting go. And indeed, that's one of the political cultural problems more broadly within Turkey is that you don't actually have renewal coming through in these political parties because you literally have to force a leader out with scandal, like the predecessor had to be forced out with scandal from the main opposition party. So at the moment, Killer Stroll is being a recalcitrant, is not suggesting in any way, shape or form that he's going to step down. And I think it's indeed quite the opposite. In that way, it's not looking positive for the opposition in terms of getting a boost from having someone come in and re-energize the opposition campaign. Tez, what do you think will happen? Um, Klish Dorola, as soft-spoken as he might be, as democratic as he eluded himself or created this image of himself to be, especially in the in the lead-up to elections, he has shown himself to be as much as the authoritarian as previous political leaders. He just has a softer sort of image. Basically, the strategy has been to bury their heads in the sand as the leadership of the main opposition party and also the leaders of the main alliance bloc. And let's not speak about the loss. Let's not undertake self-analysis and self-critical analysis. It's really engage with our voter base or we're just going to ignore the whole thing happen and act like <laughs> everything is normal. So I do not see Klish resigning under his own will for the time being. And this is only going to make people turn away from the party. And a lot of people have grown very apathetic, disgruntled and irritated because of the opposition's mishandling of this, because their inability to engage with voters and to acknowledge failure. Kulishtarol has actually come out and said, I don't see this as a failure. I see this as pretty much a victory because I got 48% of the vote. I mean, this is mentality. And, and I think a lot of opposition voters are very disheartened and heartbroken. And there needs to be a, a generational shift in these main opposition parties to reignite hope in the electorate because these older leaders have failed continuously over and over and and yet they still remain and they still refuse to take responsibility for their failures. And that's really disheartening for any opposition voter. And David, do you see little change in the political landscape while Erdogan is there? Generally speaking, um, we're not going to see, I think, a great degree of change. As your previous question alluded to, I think there's the possibility that there might be a succession plan. We don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But I think the more critical issue, because obviously there was a lot of optimism leading into this election that the unity that the opposition parties had brought together, which was unusual, was really something exciting and that there was a lot of optimism leading up to the election that the unity they created amongst the alliance partners, the six alliance partners, was unusual. It bridged the religious secular and nationalist divides. So people were quite optimistic and they had a real opportunity to really push. And they were seen as an actual potential to have a, a positive outcome. But because there's been a pushback by Kilistrol about preventing renewal within the leadership, allowing others to take the mantle, to have any of this introspection, to deal with any of the failures, it's actually looking very bleak for the opposition. And I actually wonder about the likelihood of the opposition actually remaining united going forward. I think given the tension that we saw with Akshena leading up to the election, it's quite possible that we'll see those tensions resurface and that the alliance could very, very easily become dysfunctional going forward. Well, it has actually um, the two key main parties, the good party, E-Party, and the CHP, the two biggest parties in that six-party alliance, have basically said our alliance has ended and it'll end with the election. So it was only electoral alliance and, and that's it. So we're no longer going to be working hand in hand. Now, that might change leading into the 
local elections coming up next year. But at the time being, basically that alliance has ended. Essentially, you're both giving me the impression that uh, while, as we've discussed, the opposition certainly had its hands tied behind its back to a point, it is also to blame. This is an election it lost. It wasn't just an election that Erdogan won. Ali, this is an opposition and opposition leaders that have seen Turkey transition to an authoritarian system. Kılıçdaroğlu in particular, I'm talking, I guess, specifically about Kılıçdaroğlu. He's been the head of the main opposition party since 2010, and he has presided as the main opposition party while Turkey has undergone authoritarian turn and into transition to authoritarian system. He has been a massive failure, and he has refused to give up that power. So it's not just this one election he's lost. He has presided as the opposition leader and has watched Turkey slide into authoritarianism. And you know what? And I'm very cynical, but these people are happy with the status quo as long as their power in their own parties are protected. I'll just have to say, I have to agree with that. And Tez pointed this out before, is that Kilic Trollo, I think, has reached his high point in the sense that he's never gone beyond, I think, around 25% of the vote. And I think if we look at the breakdown, it was around that mark again in the alliance. So he hasn't made any ground. So it would really be befitting if he actually stepped aside and let that change take place, because they're going to need that re-energization going forward if there's going to be any sort of push in the future. I'm sorry to end the podcast on a note of, I I guess, uh, not a great deal of optimism, but it is certainly a story that we will continue to follow here on Ear to Asia. A huge thank you to both of you for your time and for your insights. Uh, Thank you, David, and thank you, Tez. Been a pleasure. Thanks, Elliot. Our guests have been Dr. David Tittensor, Senior Lecturer in Islamic Studies at Asia Institute, and Turkish politics and policy researcher Dr. Tezjan Gumush. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. Please help us by spreading the word on social media. This episode was recorded on the 12th of June, 2023. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company. <laughs>